Okay. I'm going to do something different. I'm going to ask my wife to join me up here. And I'm going to preach my sermon today from a table. Uh, we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 5. And we, we're finishing Ephesians. Uh, if you weren't here, uh, we're finishing Ephesians 5. Um, oh, we're with Ephesians 5 and 6 today. 5, 25. Uh, and talking today, and not surprisingly, uh, about relationships, about um, uh, the you know how dads and how wives are to behave, but taking a focus today because it's Father's Day uh, on dads, and um, um, we, we we've made a three a flying visit, a three week visit. No, I've stopped to sit down, and I'll tell you why the significance of the table is here today. Uh, bless the Lord. Um, that uh, the significance of the of the table. Uh, and uh, oh yes, I will. You know that that microphone is on. Bless the Lord. Uh, uh, to talk to you about uh, about why this table is significant, I'm going to tell you that in just in just a moment. But we looked. Uh, for, we've made made this flying visit to Ephesians, the book of Ephesians, and um, uh, spoke. Uh, Chris, in his first week, spoke. About uh, about our position in Christ, how we position for worship, how uh, this is Paul's this is Paul's crowning work of uh, of talking about Christ and who Christ is and the church and our position in Christ. You know the fact that uh, that uh, that we're positioned for worship. Um, uh, Christ is is. We are now uh, quoted, quoted from a verse uh, from uh, chapter two, verse twenty-nine, as, as that as a key verse uh, about um, how the Spirit of God indwells us um, and is fulfilling who God is in us. It's the work that God's doing. Uh, how everything has been placed beneath the feet of Christ. Amen. And. Um, and then last week, uh, and, 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 real, and said that Ephesians could really be understood uh, in three things that we do all, any day. You know, that we sit, our position, where we're seated, uh, where, how, where we are standing, so when we, when we get up and stand, and then how we, when we walk. And so last week, Pastor Rod spoke about, our, uh, about standing, about the need to stand uh, strong and stand firm, and talked about that from the position of uh, the battle that we're engaged in in life uh, is spiritual. And that uh, uh, Paul says, you know, that we are not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against, uh, but against uh, principalities, the, uh, our nature, the nature of, the, 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 uh, of our battle is, is spiritual. And uh, uh, that we're to put on the armor of God. Um, and uh, uh, that armor, which is truth, righteousness, uh, serving in ministry, faith, uh, um, the testimony of salvation that God has saved us, that powerful story of how our lives are changed, and prayer. And... Uh, you know, as we were thinking, as I was contemplating this and reflecting on this yesterday, I thought about the fact that that reality that Paul is speaking about there uh, touches us, touches us today, even here, in this uh, in this room today. Uh, that there, for some of us, uh, we're, that battle and and Matthew and. Um, and Matt spoke about that a bit today, that we don't know, the, not knowing the, what battle it is, but just remembering uh, who God is in the battle. Uh, Joel Osteen um, uh, say, uh, said that, um, that, you know, any time we feel surrounded by an enemy, we should remember who's surrounding our enemy, that it's God. Amen? So now the enemy tells you he's, that he's surrounded you, or when you think that, remember that God's surrounding your enemy. That is greater than that. And, and I feel like the word today, and even just before we get to talking about, uh, about what I'm sharing here today, the word today for someone here, I believe, is this. Keep standing. 
you know, in verse 24 in chapter 6 in Ephesians, uh, Paul says that having done everything, we're to stand. We're still to keep standing. And the capacity for us to stand, no matter what we're going through, is God's ability to bring us through. Amen? That he's the one who can bring us through this. That we keep standing by his strength, by his, by his armor. Uh, God will bring you through. So whatever you're facing today, whatever you're going through, um, just remember that, that uh, these words of Paul, stand strong, keep strong, um, stand firm, even if the struggle is, uh, is, is raging. Amen? And what I'd like to do today, and uh, just talk to you about, uh, as we talk about Ephesians chapter 5, and uh, looking at the role of uh, how Paul now goes and describes how things should be at home. Um, <clears throat> it's referred to in Ephesians as, uh, by, by scholars as a domestic code. You know, it's how you're going, it's how you live. Uh, and uh, and uh, some, some guidelines for that, some rules on how to live. And you, and you have, uh, uh, when Martin Luther comes along, uh, the reformer, Calls, uses a table, uh, uses a, a terminology, and he, say, and he calls it a, a, a house tafel. Now, I don't know who speaks German here, but I can tell you that from, from Afrikaans, and I'm glad to have Pastor Colin and uh, Shamain with him. Pastor Colin is my youth leader from way back when, when I was a youth, and uh, um, he's my youth leader, and he's been a, he's, they've been here to our church before but now living in Australia, so glad to have you with us today. Uh, but, but we would know that that terminology, that, that terminology of a house tafel, we would know that in, in the Afrikaans language as a haste tafel. Uh, very similar, it's quite a similar th thing. But, um, and we would have the concept in our mind of that table being somewhere located in the kitchen, perhaps, or in the family room. Uh, so it's not your dining room table that no one goes to or you have when you have guests. This is the table where you're talking about life and where life happens. And um, I'll guarantee you that when I, as I mention that, that for many of you, that'll trigger some memories. That'll trigger memories, might, might even be realities right now, but memories of what those tables have looked like in your life. You know, who's, who used to sit at that table? The people that have come and gone. Some of the things that happened about your life at those tables. I mean, I, I, you know, it, it has changed in many ways, I would say, uh, with the advent of technology and people's lives and things that people are doing. It, it's still, it's, some of you still have that. Some of you still have that meal time, that strong meal time, and where the family table is a table of business, where much happens, a great exchange of life happens. I mean, I think of how, you know, I, for me, I, I think they'll be the most endearing memories of my life. It's what happened around our tables. So, uh, so you have, uh, you know, I, I, I know one of the features of that is, is all the, the boys who would sit around that, and I have five brothers, and we'd sit, we, we used to sit around that, the table and um, my, my dad observed something which he thought was a, must have thought was a correct theory, a, a proven theory like gravity, uh, you know, like I, I, is it Einstein's theory of gravity? Uh, he must have thought that he'd stumbled on a theory because he would often repeat it and he would say, which would be this, he would say that to the extent that my brother's stomachs were full uh, was the amount of nonsense they would talk after dinner. I mean, you were, you were mercilessly teased on our table. And, uh, and the worst thing you could do was to admit, admit that they'd struck a blow. You know, that was like if you took offense to something. Uh, but I remember those were places where we were teased uh, a lot and where we laughed a lot. Um, but those tables were very significant for our family. They were significant to people that were friends and strangers that came through. And there were often people who sat at that table 
that might not have had anywhere else to go, uh, but, but uh, came there, got a place, and it made a significant difference in people's lives, you know. So in a way, what's happening here um, is we're gathering, Paul, Paul's gathering us around the table. And he's talking about some issues that are going to have a bearing on, our, on the way we live, the way we conduct ourselves. And what I'd like to do today is, as we read the scripture, is just keep it in your mind, because what I'm going to do is go back just a bit further than that and talk about some of the things, because, you know, if you pick this up in isolation and just... Uh, look at those roles, then you're missing something that Paul is actually bringing to this conversation. And uh, what I want to do with my time today is to just spend some time talking about those things that he points out, because they're absolutely relevant today. So let's, uh, I'm going to ask Debbie to just read uh, Ephesians chapter, Ephesians, uh, from that reading, Ephesians 5. Uh, bless the Lord. You know, you can't find your own scripture here when you're looking for it, but okay, that's, there you go. Actually, read from verse. Yeah, oh, yeah, where is it from? And I, we have it up here too. Ephesians 5, 25. <clears throat> Living by the Spirit's power. So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Don't be drunk with wine, because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs amongst yourselves, and making music to the Lord in your hearts. And give thanks for everything to God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Any more? Keep going right up to 6, verse 4. Wives and husbands, and further submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. For, for wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of his wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He is the saviour of his body, the church. As, as the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies, for a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body, but feeds and cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church. And we are members of his body. As the scripture says, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. This is a great mystery, but it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. So again I say, each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. All right. Let's just pray. Let's just pray for a moment as we uh, just invite the Lord to just come and settle on us here by His Spirit. Father, ask today that in these few moments as we contemplate to Your Word, that You would make it alive to us. That Holy Spirit, uh, You would touch something in each soul, in each individual. And... Uh, Lord, as, as we would be, as it were, sitting at a table today, all of us uh, recognize that the Father of that table is you. And pray that through your Spirit, Lord, as you know the needs of each one of us, uh, will touch us. I pray, Father, that today and this month we'll see an incredible touch on families, uh, richness come to homes and to marriages, uh, a new level of uh, friendship and intimacy in marriages, and uh, a greater connection 
between children and their dads and mums. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. What Paul touches on here, and in fact what happens in Ephesians chapter 4, is that Paul switches from this, you know, talking about who we are and talking about Christ, and he, and he changes and begins to talk about what the implications are for us because of the, what he has done, the work that he has done, that, what it actually means. And, uh, and they're profound. They are profound. And I, I, I want to focus on four of them because they're relevant for how we live and how we see our roles even as, as fathers, as husbands, as mums. And the first thing that you would have to go to is, as Paul makes that change in chapter 4 and verse 1, and speaks uh, about a life now lived, uh, to be lived, that's worthy of this calling. That we're to walk, in some translations, worthy of the calling that Christ has put to us. And, and what he begins with is to talk about what is consistent uh, with the life of a person who has discovered Christ, a person who has become a follower of Jesus. What, what change needs to be evident? And in the, in the context of, uh, of what was a typical male-dominated uh, traditional family setting, he's, he's introducing some things that are incredibly countercultural. Incredibly different. Uh, what was called uh, by scholars the part of familiar, which was a, uh, which was the fact that the dad was the, the almost like in an autocratic role, not, not, but had authority over many things. Had authority over his household and over his slaves. Uh, was the head of his household, and um, might have been seen in some cases, and might have in some cases been dictatorial. And being, you know, being, be, uh, and that, and that value of of male domination might have permeated the society. He talks about Paul now comes out with these radical content, concepts, and he says that we're to walk consistent with the things that Christ uh, is transforming in us, and he picks two areas. He speaks about character. And, 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 and that character, he says, has got to have qualities in like humility and patience and bearing one another in love. In chapter 4 and verse 1 and 2. And gets, and gets intensely practical because he talks about what things we should put off and what things we should put on. So that, so that this encounter with Christ should be transformative. Things that affect our morals and our ethics and our principles. The things that we no longer do or ought to do. And you imagine this, you imagine what's happening here, that into these new young churches, Paul is talking about a code on how to live. It's extraordinary. <clears throat> When, you, when we did counseling, one of the things, and Deb would remember this, one of the things that we did when you, when you were counseling and the counseling process and the different models for counseling processes, but one of the things that you would tell a person that you're counseling, uh, uh, take them through, is how to put off what we would call, say, wrong thinking or old thinking and put on new thinking. That you begin to exchange in your mind, uh, in your heart, hopefully, uh, certain things that you held on to and believed and make a decision to believe some new things. You know, to not hold on to resentment, for example, uh, and to adopt forgiveness, for example. Paul is doing this. He's saying there's some things that you used to do that you can't do anymore. There are some things now that you have to do, have to put on a new way uh, of thinking. You know, you know, when I thought about this, I thought, uh, uh, and, I, and to some extent, you know, that's an exercise 
that's, that's internally generated. We, we, we make the decision to do it. But, but, I, but there's something else here. Uh, and, and, what it, and what I found it to be was something that has been an experience of where I came from. That in the journey of our family's life, I saw the frontline transformation of people of people's lives. And, and I'm sure you've done that too. I saw people who, who were alcoholics, and people who were violent. Uh, I, saw, I saw things that happened uh, in, that, in that setting of a life that did not, did not acknowledge Christ as Lord. And I saw the transformation of how those people lived, including in my own home of how they lived that brought this message of a changed life through to me most dramatically. More convincing than anything else. And you know the, and you know the, the aspect, because you, you know that this has, to be, uh, this has to be aided and led, even powered by the Spirit. Because what you see is not just a change of behavior, but a change of character. That the leopards do change their spots. The, the other thing that Paul speaks about here, the second thing that he speaks about, so the first thing is about values that are consistent with a Christ follower. The second thing that he points out is the importance of unity. It's amazing how early he speaks about unity. And uh, says in verse 3 make ev of chapter 4, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Wow, my time is going here. Uh, if we had a consultant at our board meeting. He was actually quoting the same scripture the other day, so uh, the day that he was there. And one of the things that he said about it is, that unity is not automatic. <laughs> it's not automatic. It's like you've got to make every effort. It takes an effort. The minute you have people, you have individuals who have their own view on the world, uh, you have people who are complex in, uh, you know, in the way that they approach things and see things, even in a marriage. Certainly with children. And, you know, the tendency that we always want to look out for ourselves, amen? Hallelujah, I know. It's not a good thing to say, but it's the truth, amen? Bless the Lord. You know, uh, our things are going to work out for us, our rights, the things that we stick up for, and so on. Um, and unity takes work, takes patience, takes tolerance, takes humility, takes gentleness, takes all those things that Paul is referring to in that, in that chapter. The third thing I want to say, and I'm just conscious of time moving here, uh, but the, the church plays a critical role inside and outside on, uh, on this transition and on this transformation. The church plays a critical role. Do you know he picks the gifts that he gives to the church of apostles, of prophets, evangelists, priests, and teachers, and he says it's so that you won't be like infants anymore. You know, changing every minute. Uh, upset about things you shouldn't be upset about, but that you'll grow into the head who is Christ. Uh, these diverse gifts and ministries given is so that it establishes us into maturity. Makes a big bearing when you think about this in the context of family and of relationships. Um, I, I, I just want to, I want to say something here and uh, about how, uh, you know, it really makes the point, what I'm making, I'm making the point here, if I might be as bold as Paul, who says I insist on it, um, prioritize church, prioritize having your children around the things of God, really do it. You know, I'm not saying church should be more important than God. That's not what I'm saying. 
but the outworking of faith, our interaction, uh, our capacity to serve is greatly defined in church. Greatly defined. I mean, where else would you do it? I know the rest of, uh, we should, the rest of our lives should also, uh, also God's work. I know that. But church is a critical gathering place that has more benefit than just you getting something from it. You have something to give. Amen? You really do. And uh, let me tell you that kids and, um, and what we teach them are going to be greatly affected by being in an environment like this. Um, I just want to say something about something that Joe and I are involved in. And that is, we, we, we are heavily involved in a community of pastors that meet in this area. And uh, you, some of you would know this. It would be no surprise to you. And um, Joe more than me. But our friendships with people from churches, other churches, like the Uniting Church or the Baptist Church or the Anglican Church, um, uh, and other places like that, uh, really, uh, they, they just expand the resources of what, um, of what we do. It makes, to me, uh, is a model and an example to the, church, to the community when, when churches will work, like, will work together. And you know that we've been down to the Billabong, uh, you know that Joe's gonna preach for Luke one, one of these days. Uh, we share things together. It's not all it can be yet, but I, I believe that if we join together and just are conscious of the fact that the church is wider than us, uh, it, will, it has a benefit. And I believe, and let me say this in a prophetic sense, that a day is coming when that's really going to matter in our community. It's really going to matter. The fact that we are not a sufficient resource by ourselves, but need to just be connected with the church. Number four, let me say this. This is uh, my last point. So the church I'm speaking about is important. Unity is important. Uh, values and ethics that are consistent. And number four, the centerpiece of anything that we do, of any transition, has to be love. Has to be love. Uh, in verse 16, Paul says, From him, uh, Christ, the whole body, joined together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. You know, one of the things I'm very thankful for was for my grandfather, who was a... Um, on my mom's side, who was a nicotine addict, and who uh, the message uh, that he was a, he did other things wrong too, um, but nicotine was the thing he got stuck on. He could not give up smoking, and in his perception of how he might come to Christ, that was the roadblock, and he could not come to Christ in his mind because of it. Until somebody one day said to him, come to Jesus anyway, don't worry about the cigarettes. You know, that was the turning point of my grandfather's salvation and an absolute 100% transformation of his, lives, of his life. And, and we cannot, Pastor Chris was talking about this in the board meeting in his devotion the other, on Friday, that God shows us so much grace. We must treat people the same. Amen? We, it has to be love first. It's, it's something when you look at it in Acts chapter 20, the relationship that Paul has here to this church that he's writing to when he sees them for the last time at Miletus at the port, uh, how, how that account concludes with how sad their parting is how how they how they grieve and weep. Uh, that tells you of the importance of love in our hearts for each other. Amen. Amen. Bless the Lord. Well, I'm going to finish with this. You know, you know what Paul is in effect talking about in 
chapter 5 and chapter 6, Paul is talking about a new ideology for marriage. He's talking about a new ideology. He, he takes this very sacred relationship of Jesus and the church and imposes it in marriage and picks on things that, are, that characterize Christ as the things that should characterize our relationships. That Christ is a servant, that he is faithful, that his heart is open. Imagine if those traits were evident in the way that we conducted ourselves as dads, as husbands. Imagine. Well, I'm going to finish with that today as we pray together. Let me just bow your head with me in prayer. You know, I want to just begin today, before, we, before I pray for us uh, as dads, as husbands, indeed, for our homes and families, I want to, I want to begin by uh, just pointing out and picking, stopping for a moment, uh, and talking about our great Heavenly Father, about the Lord about God who comes to us as a loving father. And, you know, I don't know where everybody is this morning, where things are in your life, but I want to tell you that the very best thing that can happen to you today, the very best thing, is that you discover what it means to have a loving father. I uh, just, you know, we were singing that song today, I Have a Maker. I have a father. You know something? You absolutely do. Even if you didn't understand the words of that. You have a father. His name is the Lord. And he reaches to us before we have reached to him. 